Welcome all to what is on your workbench, episode eight. I never actually asked your opinion on my wonderful musical talent in electrical music genre. Um, but what are your thoughts on our intro music? I mean, it's not my cup of tea, but that doesn't really matter. <laughs> okay. Not my cup of tea either, but it seems to work. So I'll get around to changing at some point. But anyway, welcome everybody. I don't know if we edited out that last second or not, but um, we were just talking about our lovely intro music that I created many, many weeks ago when we were like, we need something. So we have something. So we'll talk about making music another week when that's sitting on my workbench. But anyway, my name is Andrew with craftybeatroot.com. And this morning we also have with us the great, the powerful Chili from Allwood Solutions. How are you going, Chili? Fantastic. How about you? Good. I, I'm going to go out on a limb and say I think this is the best connection and the best sound we've had for quite a while. So watch it. That's Ooh. because I'm using the oh. shotgun mic that I use on my uh, on my SLR when I'm shooting stuff for YouTube. Nice. Nice. Yeah. Hopefully that makes a difference. Yep. Yeah, I ended up um, getting a lapel mic. Oh, I guess it would have been a couple of years ago now. And that, yeah, that improved my audio quality quite a bit. But yes, all the wonderful things that you can do. And then you turn around and see, watch some guy with a phone making better quality videos than you. And you're like, why do I bother? But anyway, how have you been? I've been very well. Been Been super busy and... Uh, got more and more projects rolling in every day, which is awesome. That's what I like. So good. Yeah. Yeah, I've been busy working on a drain to replace or to, because we just had like surface drains around the house. So I've been digging up concrete and unfortunately I wasn't sit on my workbench and it's not something I'm interested in talking about. So we'll move <laughs> right on. But that's why my workbench is a little sparse at the moment. But I am actually... um. I'm working on, for those which have video, it's it's a tradition that every day from, every day for Mother's Day, every year for Mother's Day, I um, I do a painting of my children. So I've been working on some paintings, but Aww. I don't That's really, awesome. I don't really have much to talk about that either. So let's just jump onto what's on your workbench at the moment, Chili, or pick one of the things that's on your workbench. <laughs> well, um, if you can see, for those who are watching these two slabs of wood behind me, uh, I am working on a fully slab built uh, outdoor bench for a client. And so that means that the seat base, the back, and also the leg structure are completely made out of slab wood uh, or wood that still has the uh, outside kind of sculpture of the tree um, to it. Um, and what was really uh, I think interesting about this project so far is that I got to play with a new toy. Ooh, that's um, the best. So I don't have the, the old school traditional tools uh, that would be used for carving out uh, the seat sculpture because um, it's, a, it's a pretty hefty amount of material to remove. So um, you would use what's called a scorp Okay. Um, to remove that material. And it is a, it's a big curved piece of, of metal that's sharpened uh, and has a handle on it. Um, and so you drag that across um, to, you know, kind of chisel in and, and move out big chunks. Um, or you could also use a, uh, a draw knife that has a dish shape to it. Um, I don't have any of those and they're really expensive. Um, so I was not ready to invest in one yet. So instead, I went with a modern bit of kit, which is this cuts all wheel uh, that you all use right. on an angle grinder. And it's super dirty right now because this was hands down the most resinous piece of wood I have ever seen in my life. <laughs> like I couldn't sand it. It what just gummed up. What kind of wood is it? Uh, it's Ponderosa pine. Okay. Um, so it's a pretty prevalent pine around Colorado uh, and a lot of North America. 
Um, but uh, man, it just this particular piece is absolutely dense with resin, <laughs> um, and you can feel it in the weight of it too. It's actually pretty heavy for pine. Mm. Um, so this is really gummed up. But if I bring it up to the camera for those who are watching on YouTube, you can see that this is a spiky dished wheel, uh, which was great on the angle grinder for chewing out a bunch of material and um, getting my general shape. My idea was to rough out the shape with this um, and then go back in with a sander and hand sanding to clean everything up and, and make it actually a pretty smooth, polished surface surrounded by, you know, the rough cut timber. So I was, I was gonna kind of play with this dynamic of, of kind of cabin furniture and fine furniture, which I'm still gonna do to some degree, but seeing as how sanding is not happening <laughs> on this, um, it's not gonna be as much of a, a mix as I wanted. Um, but uh, yeah, that was really fun. And this thing worked great. Um, my only regret is that uh, this one is the medium. I got the medium wheel. There's a coarse and a very coarse. And especially with how resinous this was, I think it would have been better had I started out with the coarse yeah. uh, or very coarse wheel to remove the bulk of the material and then get closer to, you know, polishing things up with the uh, medium wheel. Because yeah. uh, once I did get the material removed and was just down to you know, minor inconsistencies and kind of evening stuff out. Uh, this worked absolutely beautifully, uh, but it even did remove the bulk material too. Um, so the, that piece is behind me here. Um, it's dished way at the back and then kind of swoops up, curves over the front, just so that it's more ergonomic to sit in. Yeah. Um, and then the slabs in order to get a, uh, or for the legs, in order to get a live edge, on both the front and back. I, uh, I cut them out in two pieces um, so that I could have a live edge on the front and a live edge on the back, which will also, will not only be the back leg, but will support the backrest as well. Um, and then I planed those down, jointed them, and uh, I'll use some pretty beefy dowels uh, to just help keep them aligned as I uh, glue and clamp those together. Uh, so overall, it's a it's a pretty simplistic build. Um, I am going to put some arms on it, and uh, and for that, I'm using uh, cutoffs from the slab for the seat and the bench um, to uh, to make the the actual horizontal piece that your arm will rest on, and that way it'll have some of the sculpture on it of you know the outside of the tree. Yep. Um, and for those connections, I'm just going to use the real old school method of uh, basically through doweling with the arm pieces themselves. So yep. I'll drill through, um, taper down the, the arm so it fits in that hole of the back, and then I'll wedge it from the back so that it doesn't go anywhere. Um, so, I mean, there, there's nothing terribly intricate or fancy about the construction itself. Um, and it really is about a day project oh, wow. uh, for me, um, aside from dry times. Um, yeah. Like I've got a couple coats of uh, uh, of uh, outdoor marine varnish yeah. on the bench and seat back right now, um, and then you know I'll have dry time on the glue of the the legs, um, so it it won't be done yeah. in a day of time, but. All in all, when I add up my active hours, it'll only be about a day's work project. Okay. Yeah, it's interesting talking about how long a project tank takes because especially once I had a family, the idea of sitting down and working on something for eight hours straight is just like not even a remote possibility. And so it's kind of like, yeah, trying to sometimes my projects and trying to figure out, well, how many hours did I actually spend on that? And, you know, some of the stuff is just like, you know, the joys of working from home, I can you know, during a quick break, go and throw a coat of varnish on back inside on back into a meeting or, you know, things like that. So sometimes it works in your advantage, but yeah, usually it's just like, oh, I've got a couple hours, I need to work on this and out, out we go. And I guess that's for you at the moment, you said you've got quite a few projects going on. So that's the 
beauty of having a couple on the go is you can jump jump between what you got going on. Yeah, I I have to uh, because I have I have squirrel brain uh, really badly, and and I get bored and distracted. So um, it's very rare that I will really work on a single thing, you know, for eight hours straight. Yeah. Um, the exception to that is carving. When I get in the zone and I'm carving, I lose all track of time. I have no idea. I, I could be, I could be sitting on a piece for 12 hours and I won't know until my wife comes and yells at me <laughs> and tells me I need to like eat something or, you know, <laughs> go to the bathroom or <laughs> something like that. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah, but but I, I don't generally work straight on anything either. Yeah, it's, it's definitely one of those things that, like, when you get in the groove, it's it's super nice to just sit there and forget about it. And that's generally why a lot of my projects, if I can, they're not too loud. I'll try and do them on, like, a Friday night. Like, all the kids and family are in bed, and then I can just get in the groove and go as long as I want. And then, you know, 4 o'clock in the morning, climb into bed, and then 6 o'clock, the kids wake me up. It's like, yeah, time to go again. It's like, oh mistakes were made but for some sometimes it's just more important for me to work on projects than sleep I think my mental well-being appreciates it but yeah it's definitely time management is definitely a challenge um I guess for your situation where it's your income and my situation where it's I've got other income so it takes up my time so yeah so that's going to be a pretty heavy piece of furniture when it's done um I assume it's just going to be pretty well stationary in one spot. Yeah, it's a, we have a, my client, it's for his parents. Uh, well, for his mom, for her birthday. Uh, she just turned 80 and they have a really beautiful property up in Estes Park, Colorado. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. And so this is going to go to their cabin up there um, and be a place for them to just kind of, sit and watch the wildlife they have herds of elk that come through their property all the time and all sorts of stuff so awesome awesome yeah so i have internal thoughts on the style of work that you're doing okay. so i always find it fascinating that whenever somebody sees work like what you're doing people think oh this is how it was done in the olden days you know it looks old you get this real old feeling how common was it actually to have kind of live finished or, you know, um, unfinished edges on wood back in the day? Because my understanding is, is that back then they wouldn't have appreciated that they would have preferred a smooth finish and that's what they would have generally gone for. But I'm not, obviously I'm not an expert on that, but I was, that's kind of always been my inner monologue whenever I see something like that is it looks nice, but it's kind of a modern take on what we think the olden days used to be like well that that has to do a lot with um geography and and also economic status this is poor people's furniture is yeah. what i'm making basically um and out here in in the west um in the united states what would have been really prevalent was to do this using what are called half rounds okay um, yeah. which are you know, the, the outside cut of a tree um, where you have a nice flat board, but the bottom of it is still the outside rounded part of the tree. That's what it would have been most common. Um, and then the legs, the leg structure, um, probably, you know, what was most common then was to either have uh, stacked rounds, um, almost like Lincoln logs yeah. um, to make a base or to do um, round stock, so branches that you cut down, you taper down the ends and put through drive through holes the same way I'm going to do the, uh, the arm rests. Yeah. Um, so that would have been what would have been probably most prevalent in a lot of areas out here. Um, out east in the States, though, um, you would have had slightly more uh, hewn timbers most likely and then that uh, stick joinery um, for the legs and backrest and stuff like that um, but that was both examples of that are definitely poor people's furniture yeah I mean that's not what you know 
Rockefeller's yeah. got on his porch. No, no, yeah. this is just yeah. use what you got on your property and make do, uh, you know, to create a solution. Um, the legs that I'm doing are are actually kind of um, they're drawn a little bit more from uh, old church pews. Yeah, I was going to say church pews, where I'm getting a real vibe from that yeah, style. It's a very um, a lot of those um, in the states and in uh, in the UK, uh, those were a lot of those were built by uh, groups like the Amish and the Shakers and communities like that that have a very storied tradition of woodworking. Uh, but they worked in very simple forms because to do anything uh, embellished uh, was vain and a sin. Yep. Yep. Um, so that's kind of where my legs were inspired from is more that tradition, which was happening um, actually earlier than that kind of rough, you know, half rounds and stuff like that was done. Um, it has an even longer history, but they definitely coincided um, historically. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's just very fascinating because I find it's, I'm delving into medieval clothing and stuff like that at the moment. And it's definitely one of those things where people get this misconception that because somebody was poor, you know, they were wearing a Hessian sack and it's like, well, you know, obviously at the real edge of society, that would have been the case. But the difference was, is they would only have one dress or one cloak and they wore that, you know, all the time, but it was still a good quality piece of clothing because it had to last while like once you went up the once you went up the levels your like the fabric might change they might go from a wool to a silk but the shape was generally the same I mean maybe not so much in the medieval ages but when you definitely get up into the um like Victorian kind of in those ages in the 17th and 18th centuries but yeah it's definitely one of those things where it's everybody's kind of perception of what it used to be like and what it actually was like like I feel like some people almost get disappointed that oh they actually did like a really good job back then um so I was curious on that style of woodwork because I know it is quite popular with certain people it's not I mean I I think it has its place I think what you're going to do is going to look absolutely beautiful but um sometimes it's not my cup of tea and I prefer the more finished look um and as, I was just kind of curious as to where that that breakdown and obviously yeah for those frontline settlers yeah, they're just going to hack down a tree and, you know, oh, we build a house. So what's what have we got left over? Quick, make a chair out of that because why not? It's going to work. We're going to be out tracking all day anyway. So, um, yeah, it makes that makes perfect sense. Yeah, it's a, it, it's not really my preferred style either. I, I think the rustic look is overdone in a lot of ways. And especially out here in the mountains, um, it's just it's almost like you have to do that yeah. especially if you've got a cabin like you go to any cabin yeah. out there and it's it's like and i mean it looks beautiful i it's yeah it's i think that's that's this is where the term opinion is um very warranted is is it can be great and it can be an awesome piece of work but you know it's yeah, it's not my thing yeah i i lucked out um well i didn't really luck out I, i'm very picky about my clients um <clears throat> because if somebody brings me a picture and says make this i yeah. say no, but <laughs> here's the number of somebody who will. Um, yeah. um, that's just not how I work. Um, and this client, um, I know fairly well. And so they did come to me and said, look, here's the deal. We have this slab of pine that has been in my parents' garage for 10 plus years. <laughs> and they've always said they want to do something with it. So, you know, we want to have something made for mom for her 80th birthday. Um, we want to do a bench and that's it <laughs> like, yep. that's that's the direction he gave me he said i know that you you know this is what you do you're the expert i'm going to rely on you um i just want you to use this piece of of timber and i said awesome yeah so no, that's, that's why awesome. i kind of went more with a a blending of styles and bringing some kind of modern slightly more polished lines um into this rough lumber um, to kind of create that yep. juxtaposition and create a piece that's a little bit more interesting and it's not going to be anything that any of their other neighbors have their other neighbors may have some oh, yeah. benches you know that are made out of slabs or, or half logs or something and so there, there's going to be some similarities but their neighbors are going to go man that's I should have done that. <laughs> who, who made that we need that number 
yeah no it's it's yeah it's funny because around in australia it's very common to have like a a bench out on your veranda kind of thing kind of like the cabins and it's quite also common for people to kind of snatch up old pews from churches um but there's not that much of that available these days because the churches that have the pews try and hang on to them and the the rest of them all been snatched up so because i know my father when he made um the box for a grandfather clock he his original plan was to try and use old church pews but um he ended up having to go with some kind of nice freshly cut wood but yeah it's definitely yeah definitely a nice nice looking chair and if it's if it's worked well for churches for hundreds of years and should work plenty good for an outdoor bench watching the elk yeah yeah so <laughs> just just don't just don't do what um one of my my grandfather and my brother's church that they go to they have pews and they've got the seat and the backing of the seat is like this high so if you ever take a child that's like less than five years old you guaranteed through the back through the back every time I was there for a baptism and there's like, where'd my child go? Oh, there they are on the floor. Pick them up, put them back. I, I have a feeling you've got that covered. That, that would definitely be a design flaw. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's a lot that goes into um, creating ergonomic seating that a lot of people don't realize. Um, you know, things like you generally look at a chair from across the room and you go, okay, that's a 90 degree angle. No, no, it is not. 90 degree angles are very uncomfortable. The seat itself is not even flat. It sits back slightly so yep. that um, your feet can be on the floor flat for the average person and the chair is right under your legs. Uh, then your butt sits down a little bit further. And then yep. the angle of the bench back to the seat is greater than 90 degrees um, in order to be ergonomic and comfortable. Um, which uh, I learned that the hard way uh, before I picked up some books and really read into uh, the design process. Um, but I've, I've kind of settled on some general ranges that I like now for me. Yeah, I'm, I'm not in a position where I kind of am going to be making any chairs anytime soon. So I'm kind of okay with that. Although I did watch a YouTube video where they were making um oh, i don't even know the style but they were using green wood and now mm -hmm. the dowels and then they're basically letting those joints expand and super lightweight and yeah it was like oh i could see myself trying to make something like that but not anytime soon because chairs are just yeah, this uh, queen's chairs yeah um those are great i love that i mean it's it's a phenomenal process um, yeah and completely different to most other styles of, of chair manufacturing um, uh, in that, you know, primarily you're working with green wood is, mm. you know, one of them that's just, that's weird. Yeah. Yeah. Just the, the strength and the curves and the lightness you can get. I mean, I can always, I always respect, and this is kind of my biggest pet peeve with modern furniture is that people love big, heavy furniture. And I'm like, no, like if it's heavy, it's not designed right. It should be just strong enough and just heavy enough to be the strength that it needs. If it's any heavier, you know, that's why I love like the panel and frame designs and things like that, because it's just, I mean, even if you go back 40 years where they were using like thin plywoods around frames and things like that, you know, it's, you still get that strength with that lightness, which, which is why, I mean, I move a lot. So I guess that's my, <laughs> when you've had to move furniture, like, ah, oh, this is too heavy. But, and, and I am, I am of that other, <laughs> that other group that, that I like I like my furniture to have a heft to it yep um for most things for most things <laughs> um because you know that a piece is is well built when it's got a certain kind of heft to it not just yep. heavy yeah but heft yeah um I, I look at those things differently because MDF is friggin heavy yeah <laughs> Yep. So you can have a heavy piece of furniture that has no heft to it. Yep. Um, I have a bedroom set upstairs because I was like, for my daughter, I'm like, okay, we're going to buy a nice bedroom set for her and she'll be able to have it as she grows up. And I'm like, oh, that seems a reasonable amount of money. That should be pretty good. All MDF. And I was just like, I'm going to have to rebuild this at some point, not out of MDF. And that's why I ended up making my boys' bed, bedroom stuff because it was just like, 
can't can't find it so yeah i've got i've got a tabletop that i built for our dining room um and it's solid oak um except for the walnut uh swallows that i inserted into it um and it weighs just the tabletop weighs about the same as a dining room table entirely <laughs> that you would go get from a store it's like 80 pounds nice but it's also i mean it's thin and i cut profiles on it to make it look thinner and lighter mm -hmm. um you know and that's one of those really i mean we're getting totally off topic in the design <laughs> thing, which i will talk about all day every day so yeah um, so probably more importantly is andrew what's on your workbench well, apart from the aforementioned uh, projects, I've, what actually is sitting on my workbench is the painting, but that should all be finished up now. But what I did work on earlier this week and was on my workbench is a little bit of bookbinding. Yes. So I um, yeah, I don't really have. I'm definitely not an expert, as you've all probably got to know by now. But um, this is something I discovered. Ooh, must be about four or five years ago now. I was in the US and I was heavily into uh, lightsaber replicators, replications, um, as you are. And I came across an ebook. Um, and the wonderful folk at the RPF, um, so if those of you that are somewhat interested in anything to do with replicating props, go to the rpf.com forum and that is a whole website dedicated to people going into absolute minute detail about replicating props. And some of their favorite uh, topics is lightsabers. And, you know, normal people might say, well, you know, it's just a lightsaber, whatever, you get a piece of metal and, oh, no, 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 no. These people have stencils that you can purchase that replicate the wear marks on the original hero props. And so these fine folks, and by the way, I love these kind of people, like, I wish I had the time and the effort and the focus to do that, but they made a book. And the thing I love about this book is it covers, for those of you who have a picture, I'm just showing up some pictures, but they basically go through every single iteration of the lightsaber. And no, I'm not just talking about, you know, Luke's from A New Hope, Luke's from Empire Strikes Back. No, 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 they're talking about the three original hero props that they are aware of based on screen captures. They're talking about the two stunt uh, replicas that were originally used for Obi-Wan, but then they actually became Luke's version in um, Return of the Jedi. And, you know, these are awesome people. And so they, um, and they talk about, so for those of you, we, like, you're talking about going down a, um, things that I can talk about all day, but like they, they go into Obi-Wan's lightsaber, which is actually an amalgamation of different parts, including the fins from a Browning machine gun, a piston from a uh, supermarine rocket, uh, uh, some kind of engine, the turning knob from a, um, a sink in, the, in Britain. It's just unreal. But anyway, slightly off topic. These fine people made an ebook. Now, the reason why they made an ebook is the same reason why the engineering world, we have all of our standards in electronic version, because that way, as soon as you print it off, it's out of date, right? So basically we have documents at work that if you print off as they're out of date because we there could have been updates to them and you don't have the latest version. And once it's printed off, you know, it's, it's now caught in time. And so these fine folk did the same thing, right? They, do, they created this electronic version because that way, as soon as there was an update and it was verified, they could throw it in the book. And then that way, if you downloaded that from the source, you knew you were getting the most up-to-date source or the most up-to-date version. However, I went against the grain and printed it off. Um, and then... Uh, it's not, I wouldn't say it's frowned upon, but they generally discourage people printing that off. Just that's their version of the work. And, you know, that obviously they're entitled to that. Um, but I decided to print it off just so I had a record because I don't like pulling up PDFs and trying to find stuff. And I'm not that hardcore into it. You know, I've got a few replicas in my collection and I don't, you know, the, the lightsabers that I've got are pretty well complete. There's not really much unknown about them. But anyway, so they had this ebook. And I was like, well, that's pretty cool. I can print off all of the paper and, 
you know, have it all printed out. But that doesn't look very good on the shelf, you know. I could put it in a folder. I could staple it. I could bind it with those plastic chairs. Like, that, that doesn't work for me. How hard can it be to bind a book? And yeah, that's how most things start in my life. So I did some research and I found out it's actually really easy. Um, you pretty much, anybody can pretty well do it at home if they've got a sewing needle, some thread. And I actually ended up just using a real fine drill, but you can also just use like an oar. I mean, even a pin, um, depending on how you do the um, binding. But yeah, and so I started binding books and pretty well, it works out really well because Anytime you come across like an old manual, um, you, you know, you can't find old versions of it or you have to find nasty versions or you have to find, um, they cost a lot of money, but most old manuals and things like that, you can get electronically. So I, um, yeah, so this was the first one. Um, I've got a VW van project that's sitting out there. And again, the manual, you know, to find an old manual is quite difficult. So my wife got me um, the manual printed out and I bound that. Um, one of my favorite projects was because of um, my daughter's allergies and our weird historic trek across the globe, we have a lot of recipes. Um, and so instead of having, you know, every, I'm sure most people have it in their house, right? They have a some kind of scrapbook that they've written recipes in or old family recipes. And well, ours got to the point where we couldn't actually find anything in it. So I actually digitally recreated that and um, made it all indexable and stuff like that. And so I made an actual recipe book. And so I, you know, I went and bound that. Um, and so the most recent one and the one that I was working on this last week was for my new sewing machine. And when I say new, my 1953 Singer Machine 201K. And when I went and purchased it from this nice gentleman off uh, Gumtree or the equivalent of Craigslist, um, he was going to give me a printout of the manual and um, he didn't have any copies there. So he was just like, I'll send you a link. And I found the link and I was like, hmm, I should print this off and bind this. And so what I did with this one is I, um, yeah, I printed it off and bound it. I ended up having to find a different version just because the original version that he emailed me wasn't, um, wasn't that good for binding for various reasons. And so, yeah, that's, that's what I've been working on. Now, for those of you that can see in the video, um, I've got two distinct styles. One of them I've done as a um, hardcover with like a fabric coating. And then one of them I've done with a cardboard. And this is actually a vanilla folder um, that I've just used and printed on um, to get that, get that effect. So um, yeah, and I actually have tried a few different ways of binding. Um, and this most recent one is, I think, the most authentic, almost correct. And as with most projects, um, like we've discussed, like the more you do, the more you realize, oh, yeah, those first 20 I did, I actually weren't doing it correctly. Um, and technically, these weren't bound correctly, but I was limited um, just in the way that they were printed. So most of the time when you print a book, and you can see this if you pick up any book, um, they're done in, oh, what's the term now? But basically they're done in stacks of groups of like four or five pages that you fold in half and then you basically put a thread through it and then you bind it. And so that's how I did this one. And so you get these like really nice opening. Um, these ones here, I actually did slightly different and you'll see that they don't sit quite as flat. And that's because these, the older style, um, because I couldn't have them folded in half because you know they're quite large pieces of paper. I, um, I've actually just drilled a hole straight through the end um, and then just bound it that way. Um, and that still works quite well. It just doesn't sit as flat. So um, if, you're, if you're limited, because the hardest thing with doing book binding is like most things, it's the materials you're using. And usually I try and print it on a laser jet just because that way it's a bit more robust. It's not as water sensitive, like a bubble jet or ink jet you would at home. Um, but obviously if, you, if it's not going to get wet or, you know, it's just going to be a one-off or two off use, it doesn't really matter. Um, and then generally what I use, I just use the PDF booklet function. Um, so if you've got a PDF, which most books online that you're going to find or try and print, 
or even if you make your own, you know, it's easy enough to create it as a PDF. In Adobe, you can do it as a booklet function. And so for something like this Singer manual, originally it was 48 pages. Um, so I added a few more pages to get it up to 56. That way I could split it up into groups of eight. Um, and then once I had it in groups of eight, I would then print it as a booklet and I would just go print pages one to eight as a booklet print. Then I just go pages nine to 16 all the way up to 56. And then that meant I had, you know, whatever 56 divided by eight was seven, seven stacks. And then I just sewed them all together. Quick, quick on the math there, but yeah. And then once you've got that bound, um, I'm not going to describe how you do the binding because there's plenty of good YouTube tutorials out there on how to do it. Um, yeah, you then create the cover and then you basically stick in the cover page. And that's where I like to have some fun. Um, if I can, this is just a boring brown um, cover uh, in, in, inside cave, sorry, inside cave, inside page. Um, but yeah, like for my recipe book, I use some kid art to put inside there because it's custom. But I like, like one of the best things to use is um, street directories. So I've got, um, I've got one of my, the car manual that I've got, I actually use some old street um, directories as in the inside car, inside, having trouble with that word, so inside, inside pages, cover. inside cover, yeah. But yeah, it's, it's super fun and it's a really low barrier to entry. Like as long as, the, the most expensive part is really getting it printed. Um, if you're fortunate to have an, fortunate enough to have a work printer that allows you to print off some stuff, that's the best way I've found to do it. Um, but even at home, I'll print stuff off as well. I mean, obviously you can go to your local printer and print off stuff, but it can add up. So that's really the, the most expensive part, but there's nothing more awesome than kind of having some books sitting there. And instead of trying to leaf through a folder or folding off something that's been stapled, it's yeah, I really, I really enjoy it. And you can always just use old, old fabric lying around um, to get that, that nice finish, or you can just do it with cardboard like I did. So I know that um, those, the bundles of pages, um, you know, when you get your, your group of eight um, and you fold that over, um, that then gets pressed um, to make it as thin as possible. So how did, how did you press yours? Well, you know me, I like to use the correct tools. So I generally use C clamps. C -clamps. Yep. Um, you can get a really good, um, you can get a really good press on them. And depending on the size, I'll use a board. Like to just get a piece of wood and, you know, put it on the edge of my desk or workbench, put the board on, tighten it down, um, and, then, and then do that. Because yeah, generally you need that when you're gluing the spine um, to do that. So yeah, super cool. <clears throat> but yes, it's it's one of those weird little things that you just like. Well, how hard is it? And like most things, the first couple times you do it, you're like, oh, this is pretty easy. And then you realize, oh, okay, I need to up my game in here and here and here and make it look better. And um, there are still issues that I have because I generally use like a contact a spray contact adhesive, um, contact cement for adding the fabric or however I'm connecting. And so getting that lined up um, can be a bit of a pain, but yeah, it's super, super fun. And I actually enjoy doing it as gifts. So like when I made this recipe book, I made four in total um, and gave a couple of them away. Oh, I gave, yeah, the rest of them away. And then I actually made another one of those Star Wars books for a friend and yeah, so it's 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 super fun and it's super nice to be able to like pull out, you know, rather than just yeah, like I said, a stack of paper and just be like, oh, where is it? And yeah, be like oh, it's custom bound. That's book. awesome. I I think bookbinding is is incredibly interesting. Um, I've got a good friend here that does it, and there's a pretty strong group of bookbinders out here. Um, and he actually, I, I made some presses for him. Um, a couple different styles. Um, the one I thought was really interesting was uh, for doing, uh, it's called a binding press, um, and it's for doing um, leather bound books. Um, so, you know, when you have a leather bound book, a lot of times there's that raised area on the spine. Um, and I didn't know how, how they did that, but. Not like this with hot glue yeah. and string. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, it is actually waxed thread. Yep. Um, but the press itself on either side of it, um, it looks almost like an accordion or like a concertina, like how the keys are on a concertina, like staggered. Um, well, there's pins on either side and they use those to weave this, uh, this wax thread back and forth to create however many lines and however large of a line they want on the, on the binding uh, while it's in the press. And I was like, this is awesome. Like, it's just so cool, I think, to see how some of these really simple things, simple things um, are made in the traditional way. Um, you know, and, and books are definitely one of those things that um, we're in danger of losing, um, like a lot of other craft work um, or artisan work, because so many people read digitally now, which... I understand like there's an ecological impact, um, which is, you know, there's a benefit to reading things digitally. Um, but I can't, I cannot read books digitally. I just cannot do it. I struggle something fierce. I have to have a tangible book in front of me. Um, and I think it's really cool to have those, um, those old pieces, um, which are done in a myriad of different ways. I didn't realize really how many ways there are to bind a book yeah and, and i mean definitely in modern books you know a machine does it so you know really only probably one or two ways that those machines do it um and then that hand binding it can really elevate a piece and and this is kind of one of those ways that it's a gateway into making because you can start off just making like small simple journals or you know where it's very very basic where you just literally have like your stack of paper that you just fold in half you know put that together and then um put some covers on the end and tie them up and you've got it and you can start like that and then you can go all the way up to you know replicating old hundred year old books which is just yeah it's super fun and <clears throat> it's definitely one of those lower bench barrier to entries you don't need a whole bunch of tools most people what they have in their house could do it um and it's and it's really nice i, I really like its gifts you know because you know that they don't have one <laughs> it's it's definitely a one-off kind of piece especially with my uh, custom mistakes built in there what's uh what kind of adhesive are you using when you do that so generally what i use is i um on the spine i'll just use a wood glue or a pva um obviously an acid free would be better but i don't none of mine are archival worthy i don't think so i'm not that concerned about that side of things um i have played with different methods of joining because this is really what joins your cover to your um, your main stack of papers i've played with a lot of different methods um i've used like just like kind of a paste or like I think this one I used a PVA or some kind of just paste, you know, it, um, paper glue for that. Generally, um, when sticking to the fabric, I my go-to is a spray adhesive um, or a contact cement just because yeah. it will stick and you can kind of get it prepped and then you can line it up. And once it's stick, stuck, you know, it's not going to come off. Um, yeah, I've had, yeah, sometimes it works better than others. Um, like on the cardboard, like with the most recent one, yeah, there's no way that that's coming apart. Um, and that was just, yeah, spray adhesive. Other glues, like, let me pull this one, like you can probably, it's, it, it will come off, um, but even then it's still still pretty solid. So. Again, defer to your local YouTube channel or tutorial that you're following is probably better bet than me to follow. But what I've found is it really doesn't matter. It just kind of depends on if it's going to be a book kind of like this um, this cookbook one. Is I've actually re rebound this um, just like the cover. I've done this since I actually made this, which if this I uh, made this when we were married for nine years and we've been married for 11 years. So yeah, I've, I've rebound it. Um, about a year ago, I think. So I think I was something wrong. I had it off kilter or something like that. And so I decided to rebind it. Um, actually, you know what happened is the fabric got so nasty with food and stuff. I ended up throwing it out and starting it again. But one thing, if people are going to do it, make sure two things. 
do any embellishments do that before you attach it just saying also double check you don't have the cover upside down and on the back just saying it may have happened to a friend of mine three times or four times on the same book it was a rough day that day that's yeah i bet so I, i'm i'm just gonna end this discussion with, <laughs> with an admission because you talked about using spray adhesive you know or contact cement and i always thought that contact cement was the most useful useless thing in the world because that was one of the things that like we could use like when we were in elementary school you either had elmer's wood glue or rubber cement and rubber cement failed every time it was it didn't work the only benefit to it was uh you could sniff it um <laughs> and it and it smelled delightful for some reason when i was a kid i don't there actually is science behind this um to why when you're younger the smell of like gasoline and stuff is pleasing and as you get older you don't like it but anyways um it was not until the past i don't know the past probably five no i guess eight years maybe that I learned that it was because I was using contact cement wrong my entire life <laughs> and you have to wait for it to dry before you use it like it's totally counterintuitive to yep. every other type of glue it, it, um, yeah. you actually have to glue both surfaces and let them dry and then it's called contact cement because it works when they contact each other yep Yep, 100%. 100%. <laughs> so this is one of those things where I learned that actually doing foam, foam work, and the foam people learned it from leather, because that's what everybody kind of just started off using was leather contact cement. Um, and so that's what I had lying around. So I was like, well, I have that, let me try that. Um, the biggest issue I found is that if you have any ink, you know, contact cement's a pretty solvent heavy solvent based product so you know any ink's going to run if it touches it but if you're just using plain plain paper and stuff like that and that's why i find the spray contact cement actually works quite well because it doesn't it's not a solvent based um, rather than like kind of a brush on leather leather contact cements but yeah it's definitely fascinating because knowing how the glues work you, yeah exactly you're like what this is useless how come i can't glue shoes together like they they manufacture it like that how come i can't do that if they can do it in a machine how and then you're like oh you gotta <laughs> use the right thing and you gotta actually follow the instructions which they gotta read the can <laughs> after you know 20 or so goes you eventually figure out you gotta read the can that's it's just how it is but yeah it's funny because my wife had some slippers and the and the sole was falling off and i'm like just put it on the workbench I'll fix it. She's like, oh no, I'll glue it. I'll glue it. I'm like, what kind of glue are you going to use? Oh, well, just some like Elmer's craft glue. And I'm just like, no, no, no. Like I've got, for once I've got the actual proper glue, let me do it. And sure enough, she let me do it. And yeah, now they're back up and running again. So, ah, uh, good times. Anyway, yeah. I, after all these confessions, it's, um, probably time for us to finish up yeah i need i need to go do something that makes me feel better about myself now <laughs> yeah uh, so where can people find more of you chili yes if you want to uh find more of orwood solutions and what i'm doing uh you can find me on youtube uh or on uh facebook or with solutions uh you can find me on instagram or with cs and as always, you can visit my website, orwoodsolutions.com. How about you? So you can find me at craftybeetroot.com. Um, YouTube, Crafty Beetroot, you will find me there also. If you want to find more about this podcast, um, we're at whatsonyourworkbench.podbean.com or we are on the YouTubes under the same channel. So basically, we don't have any subscribers yet on our YouTube channel. Um, but we have been, I have seen a few downloads. So if you are interested in spreading the news, subscribe at your local podcast user, uh, or whatever your app you're using, um, or yeah, feel free to put a comment or like, or put reviews in, um, all good things. So with that, we will catch you next week when we find out what's on your workbench.